when a John Fung taught meditation, he would hand people a copy of John Lee's Method 2. And in Method 2 there was a section that referred to jhana. But after he'd had people read that passage, read the whole Method 2, he'd have them put it aside and say, focus on your breath. And he wouldn't talk about jhana. He would talk about the mind in relationship to the breath. Ways of working with the breath, ways of working with the mind. Now, when teaching individual people, he would ask them to describe their experience, and then from their experience he would give recommendations using their vocabulary. And part of this was to make sure that the people didn't start competing with one another over their jhanas. And part of it was just to get them really sensitive to what was getting better inside as they meditated. I guess this is an important part of the practice. If you're constantly measuring yourself against the texts, you're measuring yourself against ignorance, basically. You think maybe the text might mean X or Y. But you don't really know. But what you can know is that while you're practicing, the mind can settle down more than it could before. There's a greater sense of ease than there was before. You begin to see that certain unskillful ways of relating to your body, relating to the mind, relating to the world outside fall away. And you want to appreciate that skill that you're developing in and of itself without any reference to how other people may be skillful or how they might measure your progress. You want to be able to see for yourself things are getting better. And as the Buddha would say, learn how to delight in that. One of the customs of the Noble Ones is learning how to delight in abandoning and delight in developing. When you see, say, that some greed that you used to have is just not there anymore. Anger or the tendency to get angry over things is getting weaker. Delight in the fact that you're able to abandon those unskillful things. As for a sense of well-being inside, a sense of being more settled, learn, learn how to delight in that. I guess this delight is what keeps you on the path. You see for yourself that it really is worthwhile. You don't have to have the books to tell you. I know of one meditation method in Asia where if they think you've gained stream entry, they have you listen to a tape to tell you what fetters you've abandoned. And you don't need to be told. If you really have abandoned those fetters, you know for yourself. If the method is constantly concerned about how someone reading the text would judge what you've done, it makes the worth of your practice depend on somebody else. The real worth of the practice is what you can see for yourself in terms of your mind developing them. This is how the Buddha developed his practice. He didn't have any texts to measure his progress against. But he noticed that when he could get the mind to settle down with the breath, and how he could get the mind to settle down with the breath, the ways that worked and the ways that didn't work, he judged it based on the level of stress and suffering there was in the mind. and the types of stress and suffering that had been abandoned. So focus on what you're doing right now and try to be sensitive to what's changing. And it will take a while sometimes to see progress. One of the images in the canon is of a ship with sails all rigged up and it's been pulled up on shore and it's just left there on the shore. And gradually the, the ropes and the sails rot away, the wood rots away. If you go today and look at it and go tomorrow and look at it, you don't see any distinction, any difference. But over time you begin to realize, oh yeah, it is rotting away. Another image is of using a hammer. 
you know, the, the handle, the hammer, over time will wear down. But if you look at it today and then look at it tomorrow, you don't see any difference. So sometimes it takes a while to see the differences. Some changes in practice are gradual. Others, though, you can see that a thought comes up that used to hook you and used to make you miserable. Now can come up and it doesn't make you miserable anymore. Appreciate that. You've made progress. And John Mahabua talks about seeing just little tiny flakes of the bark on his defilements get peeled off the trees. It takes that. He took a lot of satisfaction in that. So when you see that there are areas where you used to get angry or you used to get lustful or you used to get greedy, used to be fearful, but it's not happening anymore, or at least it's not happening as easily. Okay, you've made progress. And you want to appreciate that because the whole purpose of the practice is to see that you are making yourself happier in a totally innocent way. And innocent happiness is really rare in the world. It comes down to basically three things, generosity, virtue, and meditation. And by finding an innocent happiness, it's good for you, it's good for other people. By finding a reliable happiness, it's also good for other people, too. Because if your happiness isn't reliable, you're frustrated, and you start taking it out on others. Or if you've got something of solid worth inside, and you know for yourself that it's of solid worth, then you feel less threatened by other people, less exasperated by their behavior. And so the search for a solid happiness inside is not a selfish thing. So think of the Buddha's instructions to rule her. If you see that you've made a mistake, well, be willing to talk it over out of the desire to learn. If you're going to be proud, be proud of your desire to learn. A certain amount of pride is necessary, the ability, the confidence that you have the ability to do this. If you realize that you've done something well, as the Buddha said, take joy in that fact and then continue training. In other words, use that joy as part of the motivation to stick with it. And as you find joy in the practice like this, then the changes of the world, aging, illness, death, separation, don't hit the mind so hard. So this comes under the, the general heading of empathetic joy, mudita. We often think of it as meaning not resenting the good fortune of other people, but also means appreciating their goodness, knowing that their goodness will lead to good results, and appreciating your own goodness. Remember, you're part of all beings when they say, may all beings be happy, may all beings not be deprived of the good fortune they've attained. Okay, you're part of those all beings. So appreciate your practice. Appreciate the progress you make on the practice. This kind of appreciation helps pull you out of your likes and dislikes. You begin to realize that there's a happiness that comes from developing a skill. And the way you treat your own mind can be turned into a skill. It's not the happiness simply of having nice sights, sounds, smells, tastes, tactile sensations. You realize you've got something better that you can hold on to when the sights, sounds, smells, tastes, tactile sensations are not so good. So develop an appreciation for your practice. Find joy in the effort. Find joy in the times when you make the effort and it actually succeeds. As for the times when it doesn't, learn how to give yourself pep talks. Remind yourself that even the Buddha made mistakes. But let that thought that there is a goal that you haven't attained. Be like the tension on a, a bow when you're shooting an arrow. If there's no tension on the bow, the arrow doesn't go anywhere. The realization, though, that, okay, I've got progress I need to make. There are areas where I'm still lacking. Don't let that get you down. Make it motivation. 
a type of motivation. Okay, there's work to be done, and I know that there is a path to get out of this situation where my mind is in right now. And that can act as motivation to the, for the effort that will actually get you to the point where you can master the practice. All too often you hear is that don't have any goals. Just be in the present moment. Well, it's like a bow that hasn't even been strung. It just sits there. You can't shoot any arrows. It doesn't go anywhere. And the practice is meant to go someplace. It's meant to arrive at an area or an attainment, as the Buddha said, to know what you haven't known before, to attain what you haven't attained before, to realize what you haven't realized before. We are going someplace. Simply that the someplace is going to be right here at the mind, but it's the mind as it changes through the practice. And as it goes bit by bit by bit, you tell yourself you don't have to worry about the noble attainments or John or anything. Just ask yourself, is the mind more still than it was before? If it's not, what can you do to make it more still? more solid, to have a greater sense of belonging here. In a lot of the ways the practice is basically learning how to make you feel comfortable in your own skin. That's a lot of what concentration practice is about. As for the insights, an insight is useful if you see that it actually has an impact on helping you Develop some dispassion for things that used to get you worked up. Because that's how you know that an insight was worthwhile. You can read the insights that you're supposed to have in the books and then try to impose them on what you're doing. And sometimes the lessons from the books are helpful. But sometimes they can be accompanied by pride, and that gets in the way or an overestimation of what you've accomplished. So simply notice, when an insight comes, what does it do for the mind? How does it help the mind? If it helps the mind, okay, fine. And if you find that tomorrow the same insight doesn't do anything, okay, that the first doesn't mean the first insight was bad. It means simply you've got to develop more subtlety to your insight, try things from a different angle. But appreciate the fact that yesterday it did help. So today you can find something that will help as well. You take heart from the example of those who have gone before you. This is why we have the contemplation of the Sangha, the noble Sangha. People who started out as just ordinary people, just like us, and yet were able to parlay that, or well, not parlay, but develop in their potentials into something that was really noble. It is possible. We have their examples. That's meant to give us encouragement. But how do they do this? Well, again, they did it for themselves. They judged their practice for themselves and found that it was making them better, making them happier, making them more reliable. And just kept heading in that direction to see how far it would go. So that's what we've got to do, just keep heading in this direction. That'll give us a chance to taste some of the attainments that they attained. And as you appreciated your practice all along, it'll help you really appreciate the big things that happen in the practice as well, when they come. Because you've learned how to read your actions and appreciate what they accomplish. <laughs>